The media has been telling us that the oceans are running out of oxygen. Sounds pretty apocalyptic. What's the science behind the claims? Let's discuss. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. When people talk about climate alarmism, you couldn't get much more alarming headlines than those we've seen over the last few days. Now, we know that headline writers are trying to max up the interest. Doesn't mean that the headlines are necessarily wrong, although sometimes they can be, and other times they can be misleading. Sometimes, of course, they are indeed 100% accurate. So if we look at the underlying report that all of this is based on, what do we find? The report is this one from the IUCN. The IUCN is the body which maintains the Red List of Endangered Species, amongst other things. This report is a meta-study and a summary of the state of knowledge to date. It's the work of 67 scientific experts from 51 institutes in 17 countries, and it's the largest peer-reviewed study conducted so far on the subject. The first thing to note is that the headlines here are not new information. They read as though we just discovered something awful was going on that we didn't know before. And that's not the case. The phenomenon it describes attributes the central knowledge of the effects and their extent to research papers dating back over the last decade. Here are the headlines of what I took from reading the full report. First of all, measuring the extent of oxygen in the ocean is hard. You might think that oxygen levels would be broadly the same throughout the ocean, but that's not and never has been the case. Colder water absorbs more oxygen, and that results in waters in the coldest part of the globe taking in oxygen, and then those waters can fall to deeper parts of the ocean and circulate, meaning that absorbed oxygen can reach deeper parts of the ocean in various geographical areas and be present for significant periods of time before rising up. This circulatory system means already that there'll be variability in where oxygen is found. Add to that other factors, such as areas where warmer water will lose oxygen to the air more quickly, areas will have different impact from photosynthesis by phytoplankton and algal blooming, which may well be responsible for oxygen depletion, and you have a patchwork of variability. So having a clear idea about how much oxygen there is in the ocean worldwide isn't as simple as taking samples in the same spot regularly and testing for the dissolved oxygen. It means to have solid measurements you need multiple testing points and to build a more robust understanding of how the currents are taking in and losing oxygen in various parts of the world. One of the things that runs throughout this report is uncertainty. Every section has multiple qualifying statements about lack of understanding of the complex processes at work. Obviously, people desperate to dismiss any ideas or problems will jump on that as an excuse to dismiss the findings out of hand. But uncertainty isn't always our friend in such a convenient way, however much we might wish it otherwise, which is why corporate risk managers tend to treat an absence of information as amongst the highest risks. From the measurements that have been taken across the ocean in recent years, it's now believed that over the past 50 years, the global dissolved oxygen in the ocean has decreased by around 2% as an average. That doesn't sound like a lot, and indeed it isn't a lot per se. So far, the evidence suggests, bearing in mind that degree of uncertainty that could cut both ways, that with the worst case scenario, the ocean as a whole could lose about 3 to 4% of its oxygen by 2100. Arguably, that's not the sort of figure you expect to justify headlines such as world's oceans are losing oxygen rapidly. In one sense, it's true. But in the popular imagination, you'd probably think that headline means something more extreme than 4% by 21,000 worst case scenario. Although bear in mind that breathing water is hard work. If you don't believe me, give it a try. Uh, on second thoughts, no, don't. Just take my word on that bit, at least. Even for fish, at 100% saturation, the amount of oxygen available in one litre of seawater is around 35 times less than that in the equivalent amount of air. So the marine animal needs to pass 35 times more volume of medium across their gills, or else have to be more efficient in taking up oxygen than land-living animals. Still, you wouldn't expect a 4% drop to be the end of the world, and it isn't. However, as we noted before, these are just averages, and the ocean does not contain an even mix. 
you find areas that are significantly oxygen depleted and even some with negligible amounts of oxygen that become so-called dead zones where larger sea life, particularly fish, will struggle to live at all. The IUCN report illustrates the impact of some of these rather graphically, showing how mass quantities of dead fish and other sea life can suddenly just show up when oxygen-deprived water has flowed into town. Imagine if that happened to us. You're sitting around one day and suddenly you just can't breathe and you go running off in one direction as fast as you can, hoping to come to the end of the dead zone before you collapse. Yeah, I'm glad we don't live in that world. Reduced oxygen in water is described as hypoxia. It impoverishes the ecosystem and only the most tolerant and opportunistic species can survive in it. If we reached a point distant in the future where much of the ocean suffered from hypoxia, you'd see many more jellyfish and no tuna. That's not a great fish counter to gladden us all, bearing in mind that around a billion people depend on seafood for their principal protein. One of the creatures that has physiological adaptations that enable them to survive in extreme persistent hypoxia is this, the vampire squid. So, great times for vampire squids? Not so much for the rest. More or less zero oxygen in water is described as anoxia. At that point, pretty much no higher life survives at all. But although we're not expecting to see an ocean of anoxia or even hypoxia, we are seeing an increase in zones where that sort of depletion occurs. Predominantly, although this is human caused, it isn't climate change, but eutrophication, the process that takes place when there's runoff into waterways of chemicals containing high levels of nitrogen and phosphorus. As I mentioned in the Should You Eat Meat video, one of the impacts of growing so much more grain so much more efficiently, as we do, is that large quantities of artificial fertiliser are running off into waterways. For that reason, there are significantly more numerous areas of hypoxia or even anoxia in coastal areas. This can go on to have broader impact on a more widespread scale. It's been estimated that the volume of anoxic waters, the real dead zones, has quadrupled since 1960. So the general makeup of the oceans is important to get a handle on. The surface layer is generally well oxygenated in most of the ocean by photosynthesis from phytoplankton and the dissolving of atmospheric oxygen. To get oxygen deeper into the ocean, you're depending on something called ocean ventilation, which transports those well-oxygenated waters deeper. The majority of oxygen loss has been caused by changes in ocean circulation, which means that it's the lower levels that have been the most affected. One of the effects of deoxygenation is expected to be that the depth of water that's well oxygenated will become less deep. In the Black Sea, one of the areas where we've been able to observe the impacts more clearly, the depth of the well oxygenated layer has dramatically decreased from 140 metres in 1955 to 90 metres in 2015. That gives a foreshadow of how this might play out in wider areas of the ocean over time and gives a lie to those that will point to that 4% figure and argue that it's no big deal. The impacts don't come in the averages. As early as 2011, scientists identified that the vertical habitat range had reduced in the tropical Atlantic by around 15%, reducing the habitats for important populations of tuna, billfish and marlin. Now, of course, fish stocks can move around and to some extent avoid hypoxic conditions, up to a point. That's why, for instance, there are still fish stocks at all in places such as the Black Sea and the Baltic Sea, which have been deeply affected. Fish such as cod and herring move closer to the surface, although that can still present problems for species such as cod, whose eggs and larvae may end up below the livable level, which is what's been seen in the Baltic Sea. What's the climate change connection? We know that warmer water holds less oxygen and therefore in parts of the ocean where surface warming has been the greatest, this results in more gassing of oxygen into the air. On its own, that wouldn't be a massive problem, at the moment, it's believed that 15% of the oxygen decline can be attributed to warming-induced changes in the loss of water solubility. But warming's also involved in changing the patterns for ocean circulation, which is where the key part of the problem lies. And the two impacts together make for double trouble. So far, the models that have been developed to predict these various impacts are struggling with the complexity of the factors they're dealing with and are showing significant understatement of the observed changes that we've seen so far. 
The report says this, current state-of-the-art models simulate deoxygenation rates more than two times smaller than the most recent database global estimate. As I said before, every single section of this report reiterates over and over how much more reliable our measurement systems need to be, how much greater our understanding of the ocean currents and other factors needs to be. Since the observed changes are ahead of the model changes, it's safe to assume that as we fill in the blanks, won't all be good news? Only a fool would say that those question marks mean that we should assume the best, but equally there's no evidence right now we should assume the worst, as those headlines did. Not least because that 3-4% by 2100 figure was based on the worst case RCP 8.5 emission scenario, which isn't even business as usual. It's significantly worse than business as usual. The good news? The contribution to this process that comes from nitrogen runoff is eminently solvable. Reducing or removing the runoff doesn't instantly get results, but it gets results relatively quickly. We can modify agricultural practices, restore plant habitats and wetlands as buffers between agriculture and waterways, build sewage treatment plants and a lot of other things. The climate component obviously is more long term and connected to a whole chain of consequences that we discuss elsewhere on this channel and elsewhere rather a lot. There are certain factors that we should be very respectful of because they could indicate we have significant vulnerability. The eastern boundary upwelling systems, EBUs, are key regions because they are among the most productive marine systems in the world and support some of the world's major fisheries. They include the US West Coast, Oregon and California, the Humboldt Current off Chile and Peru, the Canary Current Iberina Peninsula and the Namibia Benguela system. Ibus have complex processes that make them more susceptible to deoxygenation as they're already prone to greater levels of deoxygenation and ocean acidification. Some of the commentary around the report has focused on how at least one previous mass extinction saw ocean conditions that almost certainly led to a massive anoxic event and that this should be taken as a sign of what could happen. They're referring to the end Permian extinction which occurred around 252 million years ago and was the largest extinction event in Earth's history. Nearly 95% of terrestrial and marine species perished we don't have time to go into great detail, but the end Permian extinction coincided with massive volcanism, which led to elevated CO2 and climate change. Extinctions in the ocean during this event happened in the face of changes in oxygen levels, CO2 and temperature. The species which almost completely died out were those that were most sensitive to high levels of CO2 and the resulting lower pH levels from acidification as well as hypoxia. However, the concentrations involved were significantly higher than anything we're either seeing or expecting and nobody should be running around saying that history is repeating itself. That extinction, although it's impossible to tell for sure, is strongly connected to a major impact event, a meteorite, and hugely increased volcanic activity. It was a very different world and a very hostile world. So, how do we summarise this? First, there's a lot more that we don't know than we do know. That means we need to find out and we need better measurements that enable us to develop better explanatory and predictive models. Second, clearly we have a problem with growing numbers of hypoxic events, particularly in coastal areas. We know how to tackle these, we should crack on with it. Third, we don't know for sure about ocean-wide levels of oxygen because the natural variability is so significant and we shouldn't overclaim. However, it seems likely there has been a reduction. But the average isn't what's important. It's about how this plays out in specific areas that may demonstrate higher levels of oxygen depletion and affect major areas of sea life. Fourth, none of this is new. We knew about the declining oxygen. We knew about increases in hypoxia events in coastal areas. This report has put more of a focus on the impacts of the processes of climate change, but that's the area where there are still the most questions. So, are the oceans rapidly running out of oxygen? Is the ocean losing its breath? No. Do we have an issue capable of creating localised problems in the short term? Yes. Do we have an issue that, if the effects of climate change proceed as expected, will get worse over the coming century? Yes. Do we have certainty of those effects or reason to believe that they achieve catastrophic proportions? 
No, but not having certainty doesn't mean you should assume. We should all be able to unite on supporting the scientific community in improving our knowledge on what's happening in this amazing, varied and complex system under stress that is the world's oceans. Only with more knowledge is greater certainty going to come.